folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchman video broadcast. You know what it dawned on me? I've never done any kind of video or teaching on the UN. I'm against the UN for religious purposes. Uh, the United Nations, there, New York City. Um, the conglomeration of hundreds of nations around the world all acting like they're getting along uh, in order to uh, stop World War III. It's, it goes all the way back to right after World War I, Woodrow Wilson and a bunch of other uh, high-ranking illuminated ones decided that maybe if we just got together, shook hands, sat around a big boardroom all together, maybe we could uh, not have any more wars. So they formed what was called the League of Nations. That didn't work out too good because they had World War II. So after World War II, they said, you know what? Let's try her again. We'll just give it a different name. That'll work. Okay? So they formed the United Nations back in 1945. And it's all about uh, this idea of getting all the nations together, handshaking over a table, have them to make rational decisions. Hopefully, now that we have nuclear bombs, we won't blow the whole world up and destroy everything that exists right now. Hopefully, we won't do that. It's actually more religious than political, and some people don't see it that way, but it actually is. It's actually based upon a religious concept of world peace. You see, the Bible teaches us, Revelation, uh, and in other places, that there is going to come a time when man is going to have, a pe have peace on the earth for a thousand years. Christ himself is going to reign over the world for a thousand years. Well, <clears throat> with everything that God does, there's always an opposite of that. So if you have Christ, you have Antichrist. If you have the millennial reign of Christ and, and an era of world peace, you have a new world order or a new age. Hitler tried this. He actually called his, his reign the thousand-year Reich, which means the thousand-year reign. Why? He had this bloated concept that he was a Messiah figure that was going to bring the world into domination and with one ruler ruling over everybody, he would be able to control everybody and there would be world peace. And that's sort of the idea behind the UN. And now let me, let me kind of just kind of illustrate this for you. The Bible says that the gospel of this kingdom is going to be preached and then shall the end come. And I believe that uh, Christ is literally, according to the Bible, is going to come down. He is going to reign for a thousand years on the earth and there will be an age of peace and harmony uh, throughout the world. And it's based upon the gospel. It's based upon the truth of the word of God. And I want you to kind of see this scenario. We're going to look at Ezekiel chapter 37. And I want to show you this because this deals with, um, and, and, and let, me, let me back up here for a minute. Uh, remember the Tower of Babel. All the peoples of the world were actually one at one time. They all spoke one language. They were in one place. And they said, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And so we know that is the Tower of Babel. God actually said, uh, no way. I already have a plan to bring peace to the world and to bring everybody together as one. Jesus actually prayed that in John chapter 17. Already have a plan and it's not yours. And so he, he ended their labor and their work on the Tower of Babel back in Genesis chapter 11. We see uh, different things like the European Union whose uh, building in Strasbourg, France, their parliament building, just happens to look a lot like the unfinished Tower of Babel. It's this idea in mankind's head that we don't need God. We can actually bring in a new era of peace and harmony without God. And so really it's all about rebuilding Babel again and collecting all the fragments of the nations that happened after the Tower of Babel, collecting them all back together into a collective like it was before the Tower of Babel. Now, let me show you, according to Ezekiel chapter 37, this is why I thought of this. In Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, God takes Ezekiel out, and he shows him this valley, and it's full of bones, and the bones are scattered all over the place. And God asks the question to Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live again? In other words, what Ezekiel was looking at 
He was looking at, and we're dealing with a prophecy of the, the nation of Israel or the people of Israel whom God prophesies is, he's going to bring back together one of these days and make a single nation out of them again. He says that here in Ezekiel 37 and in other places. God is going to do that. And I want you to see in Ezekiel 37 how God does it with Israel because the exact opposite is what happens with all of the nations of the world. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 2. He caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, thou knowest. And again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, 5. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and ye shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and ye shall live, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Notice what God says, I will do this. I will cause breath, and I will lay sinews upon you, and I will bring flesh upon you, and I will put breath in you. This is the work of God. And the work of God is always perfect and always right. The work of man is, it's not very good. Okay, um, We like to pat ourselves on the back about the things we've done, the things we've accomplished, the things we have built. But the things that we have done, we've only used God's material to do it with in God's, in God's universe. And so anyway, this is about the will of God. So verse 7, he said, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied there was a noise, and behold, a shaking, and the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Now look at verse 9. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, I want you to look at that, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came unto them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried, and our hope is lost, for we are cut off for our parts. In other words, at a time when Israel thinks that there's no hope. God is the one who's going to bring hope. So we have, the, we have the word of God going out, the prophesying of Ezekiel. We have the word of God going out. The bones come together, the sinews come together, the muscle and the tissue and everything, and the skin. But they're not alive. And then Ezekiel prophesies, I want you to notice this, to the four winds. We've done this study before in different things, but I want you to notice Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We have the four Gospels. That, the number four represents uh, the spiritual realm, and it represents the Gospel message. And so we, here we have those things working together to bring back the, the deadness of Israel. You can make this application to anything in life. Anything that in life to you is dead. Let's say you have a dead marriage. Let's say you have a dead relationship with Christ. Let's say you, dead friendships or, or whatever. Let's say that you, you personally are spiritually dead because of trespasses and sins. What happens? The Word of God prophesies to you. The four Gospels come to you. Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid your debt, paid your penalty, uh, rose again on the third day. The finished work of Christ. Christ has already done what you cannot do, and it brings you back to life again. What the, I just love that part of the Bible. I absolutely love teaching on that. I love the finished work of Jesus Christ. And remember, God says, I will do these things. And God is a whole lot better doing it than I am or anybody else, or the United Nations, for that matter. But I want you to, to kind of turn this back around now. And instead of uh, Christ, we have Antichrist. Um, instead of uh, God bringing everyone together, His people, now we have the nations of the world gathered together. In fact, I, I want to I read something here. This, this, uh, this just in, by the way, uh, in the book of Revelation... Uh, I just had a thought here. Revelation chapter 19. We have the white horse that is coming down, and that's Jesus Christ. He's going to fight the armies of the Antichrist in the last days. Jesus comes down in Revelation 19. And I, and I look here in Revelation 19, or in verse 19. And the Bible says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together. 
to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So here we have the beast, we have the kings of the earth who are over the nations, and they are gathered together. That's what the United Nations represents. It is a, a prefiguring or a precursor to the end days gathering together of the armies against the Lord Jesus Christ. They lose. It's not going to work. Okay, It's not going to happen. So how does this happen? Well, the four winds go into Israel and blow breath into Israel and they live. There's an opposite of that. Instead of the four Gospels, it's called the four elements. You've heard of this, haven't you? Earth, air, fire, and water. Um, witchcraft. Witchcraft, which is the total antithesis of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Witchcraft is like the opposite religion of the religion of Jesus Christ. Witchcraft uses... Now, if you talk to witches or you look at some of their material or whatever, they say, we're just using nature... Nature has forces, nature has powers, and we're using nature, and we're going we're gonna to make the world better. Okay? Uh, not all witches have you know, long noses with warts on them, but I have seen some that have. Uh, witchcraft is built upon the idea of the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. They call it nature. They call it the powers of nature. Um, and that when you conjure or bring together the four elements together, that something else happens with that. Let me tell you what the Bible says those four elements are. Remember the number four deals with the spiritual realm. And on God's part, it represents the Gospels. On the Antichrist part, it represents the elemental powers of witchcraft. And there are spirits involved in this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and and blood, but against principalities. Again, notice, let's count here. Against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's four of them. These are devils. These are fallen angels. These are evil angels, the Bible says. These are powers that are working in contrast and contrary to the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Word of God. And notice that there are four of them. And they are what represents earth, air, fire, and water, the elements. And so it's the, it's the powers of the occult that are going to bring together the nations of the world to fight against Jesus Christ in the last days. This was also a sort of referenced in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Daniel has a vision. And look at what he sees. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and vision of his head upon his bed. And he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Think about that. Then look at verse 7. Now up to verse 7, he deals with seeing four particular beasts rise up out of, the, uh, out of the sea. In Daniel 7, after this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. I want you to notice the iron teeth, devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. Those ten horns are ten kings. Daniel chapter 2 verse 40. The iron teeth that Daniel saw in the fourth beast connects you to Daniel chapter 2, the image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. It had the head of gold, the chest of silver, uh, the legs of brass, and then the feet of iron and clay. There were four different parts to this, and it represented four different kingdoms. And so Daniel says in verse 40, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And he keeps talking about uh, he keeps talking about iron and so on in this iron kingdom, and we're going to reference that here in just a little bit. But I want to concentrate on um, on these four elements and the power of witchcraft, the power of the occult that is going on. We know that. Uh, in most places in the world, occult mysticism, uh, New Age ideas, mystic religion, even mystic Christianity all over the world in the form of Roman Catholicism and other forms of 
alternate Christianity that do not conform with the scriptures. These are all part of the devil's religion of witchcraft, and it's based upon principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places, high places which represent uh, the four elements. When you look a little bit at witchcraft, and I, I study it just, just a little bit, not a whole lot. You look at witchcraft, and along with the four elements, witches, the occultists, Satan worshippers, the some of them like I don't. I'm not a witch. I'm a pagan. Kind of the same thing. Okay, uh, even though they wouldn't say that it was. But anyway, paganism uh, and witchcraft and the New Age movement—they're they're all using the same thing. They're all using the four elements. Well, coinciding with these four elements. Uh, are four very, very special days that lie throughout the calendar year. Um, we have the winter solstice or Yule. We have midsummer, which is June 21st, uh, the summer solstice. Uh, from there, we have the, uh, the spring equinox or Ostara. And we have the autumnal equinox, the fall equinox in September, uh, called Mabon. And then we have the, the cross uh, the, what they call the cross quarter celebrations, uh, Samhain or Halloween is one of them. May Day on May first is one of them, and so on. But anyway, they deal with the f these partic four particular days out of the year: the, su the summer solstice, when the sun is at its highest point in the northern hemisphere. And remember, we've taught this before: the sun actually rises from east to west every day. But every year, it rises and sets north to south. We, it rises, and it's at its highest peak on the summer solstice. It's at its lowest peak on the winter solstice. So we have four big days throughout the year that the occultists, the pagans, the witches, the New Agers, and practically everybody else in the whole world worships or d does some sort of commemoration on these particular days because of what they represent. They represent the powers of a god which is, has been universally worshipped as the sun god. Uh, uh, Albert Pike talked about it. Manley Hall talked about it. Um, uh, the New Agers talk about the power of the sun, the sun god, and so on. Uh, and along with that now, so we have the four elements, the four uh, spiritual uh, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, and high places. We have um, uh, the four sacred days in there. And then we have the representation of the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. That's, that's where I'm going with this. So if you look on a compass, uh, here's a graphic of it, of it here. You have, you have what looks like, and I want you to get this, and you have what looks like a, a cross. Okay, And this cross symbol, not everything that's a cross is Christian. Okay, just I'm going to show you that. We have a cross, and it represents the, the power of the four. Well, think about this. We have the cross of Christianity, which represents the gospel. Four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In the occult world, you have a cross as well, but it represents the power of witchcraft in the elements, or in the uh, equinoxes and solstices, or in the uh, witches when they do rituals. They will face in the four cardinal directions and, and pronounce spells and so on. North, north, south, east, and west. Now, I said all that to show you this. The United Nations logo is actually based upon that principle. I want you to notice you see there the idea of the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, and you have the cross directions and so on built into that logo. We're actually, we're going to deal with the secret of not necessarily the, well, the United Nations, but the secret behind the logo of the United Nations. I was, uh, it was, I remember it was on a Saturday and I looked at that and it just, it just jumped out at me just like that instantly what this thing was all about. And we're going to deal with why and, and you know our ministry, we deal with, with symbols, logos, and things like that because they try to conceal a hidden message or a hidden idea in it. Where did I get that from? Well, I get it from uh, uh, Fat Albert Pike here, uh, the grandfather of American Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite Freemasonry, uh, writes a book called Morals and Dogmen. In this book, he says symbols rep have two ideas. One, the exoteric. The ex exoteric means 
the outside meaning, which is what we tell everybody is what it means. Uh, what does the square and compass mean? Well, it means that the mason is to square his life with something and circumscribe his whatever. Okay? And they tell you that with a straight face. That's what it means. But then Albert Pike says, well, then we have the esoteric. The esoteric is the actually the true meaning of the symbol, which we don't tell anybody. In other words, we lied about the first one. And as far as the second one was concerned, we're not telling you anything. I actually have a Bible that reveals the deep and, and secret and hidden things of the world. And so what this book won't tell you, this book will. Okay? So let's, let's get a, a few clues here. I want you to look at the United Nations logo. Um, we have a, an emblem of the earth. We see the nations there. We see the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. It looks like a compass there uh, with rings in it and so on. We're going to talk about that. But then on the outside, it has a, a wreath of laurel. And uh, I did. I was looking at that, and I wasn't going to pay much attention to it. You know, I'm going. You know what? I'm going to look at that and see what that represents. Manley Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. I reference this book a lot because it's a it's a good book, not the good book. Manley Hall went through I don't know how many thousands of documents, texts, ancient books, and so on, and he took practically all of the mystery ideas, the mystery concepts, all the sun gods, all the earth goddesses. Everything, and he put them together into a book called The Secret Teachings of All Ages. And basically he said, in every one of these myths and every one of these stories, there's an element of truth here about a great secret that they all tried to preserve. What is that secret? It has to do with the rise of the Antichrist in the last days. We're going to see this in this particular logo. So I was looking at this wreath. Here's what Manley Hall says about the symbolism of the, of the wreath of laurel. He says, wreaths were worn during initiation into the mysteries and the reading of the sacred books to signify that these processes were consecrated to the deities. Notice that's plural. That means gods. On the symbolism of wreaths, Richard Payne Knight writes, instead of beads, wreaths of foliage, generally of laurel. Notice that I have that underlined. Olive, myrtle, ivy, or oak appear upon coins, sometimes encircling the symbolical figures and sometimes as chaplets upon their heads. All these were sacred to some peculiar personifications of the deity and significant of some particular attributes and, in general, all evergreens were Dionysiac planes. That is, symbols of the generative power signifying perpetuity of youth and vigor as the circles of beads and diadems signify perpetuity of existence. Let me, let me kind of bring this down to words that you can understand here. He says, number one, that laurels a lot of times represent what he, he used the word chaplet. That's the word for a crown. It fits on the, the cap or the head. Okay, So laurels represent a crown. Who wears a crown? A king. A king always has a kingdom. So we look at the United Nations logo again, and the earth is his kingdom, and he is the king, and he's wearing a crown. And then he says these things are generally of laurel, and I'm going to actually uh, show you a verse in the Bible that talks about that. It was pretty interesting when I found it. We have the laurel, we have the, the wreath around it as, as, as a crown, and I want you to notice on the logo that there are actually two of them and they are sort of connected together there at the bottom. Let me tell you what that represents. And in fact, you'll see this in just about every logo that there is. Uh, in, uh, man, in this book here, Morals and Dogma, you have the double-headed eagle. You have two heads and they're actually fused together. You have the two reasons they're fused together. The square and the compass, they're fused together. Any kind of symbol where this is kind of connected like the yin-yang with that, is a symbol of fusion. You have opposites, left and right, male and female. Notice that in, in when, when Manley Hall was talking, he referred to it as the generator, generative power. This is the idea that the male comes into the female and they get together and that's what produces a king. Remember the giants in the Bible. They were of the sons of God, this side, and daughters of men, this side, and they were joined together. That's who this. That's who the giants were, 
And notice in Daniel chapter 2, you remember the iron kingdom is mingled with miry clay. Miry clay represents humanity in the Bible. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what this is all about. This king that is over this, these kingdoms in the United Nations logo represents the hybrid between heaven and earth. Now you think about this. Remember Christ and Antichrist. Christ was God and man. The Holy Ghost conceived inside the womb of, virgin, of the Virgin Mary. And so Christ is the sinless Son of God, and the Antichrist is going to be a hybrid between the heavenlies, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, and the earthly, sons of God, daughters of men. That's what this wreath represents. He goes on to say the wreath signifies the crown of the initiate, which is given to those who master, look at here, the four guardians and enter into the presence of unveiled truth. And so the wreath is placed upon the head of an initiate, someone who's being initiated into the mystery religion, and it signifies that he knows how to use the power of the four. Principalities, powers, rules of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. Are, are we getting something here? Okay, this laurel wreath of the UN logo. They say, well, it's a symbol for peace. Remember, Albert Pike said, what we tell you, we lied about. It's not really a symbol of peace. That laurel wreath and the opposites and everything, they represent one who is coming who is going to rule over a united kingdom of all the nations in the earth together. Read Revelation 13. Read Re Revelation 17. It's all there. That fourth beast is going to conquer the entire world. Now, it's interesting that this wreath is, is made out of what is called laurel. That's like an, uh, an evergreen. Okay, uh, Never dies. Uh, it's always green throughout the year. Um, it's called actually called the Bay Laurel. You actually find that in the scriptures. It's pretty cool. Psalm chapter 37, verse 35. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a green bay tree. Look at the logo again. You have the Bay Laurel, the green bay tree, circling and encompassing the entire earth. I have seen the wicked in great power spreading himself like a green bay tree. This is a prophecy of the Antichrist in the last days. And it just shows... I, you know what? I think everything that the devil is doing in these days, God's got it all written down in the scripture. Let's just go find it. Let's go find some more about what's going on, shall we? I love this Bible. I love the truth that it reveals. If you look at Revelation chapter 9, verse 11, notice that they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath this a name, Apollyon. That means destroyer. The destroyer of the Gentiles, the Bible says, is on his way, and he will use the power of the United Nations. That's what the United Nations is all about. It's all about crowning the emperor of the world the Antichrist, in days maybe shortly to come. I don't know how soon, but I believe it could be. Now, we're going we're gonna to zoom in a little bit. That's the imagery of the laurel, okay? And, and that could be right there. We could stop right there and say, yep, that's it, okay? But let's look a little bit closer. Let's zoom in now to this um, image, the, the, the United Nations logo. Let's look at it. Notice we have 32 sections that the earth is divided up into. And then in the middle, we have a center section. Okay, It's called, um, in the occult or the New Age, it's called the cross point. Wait a minute. There are churches called that. Where did they get that from? They didn't get it from the Bible. There's no cross point church in the Bible. There's no cross point concept in the Bible. And it all has to do with cross point or center point where the four are coming together. Remember, the initiate has mastered the power of the four. Do you remember um, Ted Turner put out a cartoon back in the 80s called Captain Planet? Okay? And Captain Planet was always summoned 
by these kids with these little powers and they brought earth, air, fire, water together and out of the earth rose up the savior of the earth, Captain Planet. He's going to save the earth from these evil men who are trying to make money on the earth. Okay, that's what he, Anyway, that's where Ted Turner got the idea from. It's the four coming together. Manley Hall talks about the pentagram. The pentagram is basically the four coming together and a fifth one rising out of it called ether or spirit. There was a movie called The Fifth Element, Bruce Willis. And it was about that idea that the whole earth is going to be saved by a fifth element element or spirit. And so here you have, you have uh, at the cross point in the United Nations logo in the center, um, you have a fifth something another coming out. So I want you to notice this. 32 sections and one section in the center. What What is that? That's 33. The Japanese flag. The Japanese, remember, the sun god was worshipped everywhere in the world. Just different names, different titles. They worshipped his rising and his setting. When he rises, he's born. When it sets, he dies. He has to go into the underworld and he is going to rise again. They all worship the sun god in the exact same way. Not only the rising in the east and the west, but the rising from uh, from south to north, from the winter solstice to the summer solstice. And the Japanese were no different. They worshiped the sun god. And In fact, the emperor of Japan, Japan is still one of the few nations in the world that still has a king, an emperor. And the emperor of Japan is the sun god. And their flag, it was their old flag, but I think the Navy still flies this kind of flag. Uh, notice we had, if you count, you have 32 rays that are coming out of the sun, and you have the sun itself in the center, or the focal point, or the center point. That's the number 33. We've seen that before. The Jesuit logo, the Jesuits. You know, these holy clerical men that are trying to educate people all throughout the world and teach them Jesus Christ, right? No. The Jesuits have been and always shall be the uh, spy agency and the military arm of the Vatican. They have their own pope, by the way. He's the black pope. And they answer to him, buddy. They don't do what anybody else, anybody else says except the black pope. Ignatius de Loyola ransacked earth religions, brought in all these occult practices, mysticism, chanting, contemplative prayer. That's in the churches right now. Ignatian contemplation is named after him. And he taught his priests to use the powers of the occult to empower them so that they could go out and conquer the world. And so in the Jesuit logo, see the cross? See that? It's there. And then you have um, the rays coming out of the sun here. You, guess how many of them there are? There's 32 of them. And the sun is the 33rd part in the center. Notice the cross. And you have the letters IHS. Now, again, the Catholic Church says, well, that simply is the first three letters of Jesus in the Greek language. No, it's not. It's not. Or some would say that means in his service. Really? Whose? Now remember, Albert says, if we tell you what it means, we're lying. It's not really what it means. We actually have another meaning. It actually references a phrase called in hoc senio, which means in this Sign. I want you to go back and look at the Jesuit logo. In this sign. And then there's a word. Vinces. Which means conquer. In this sign, conquer. You know how the Roman Catholic Church got started? Emperor Constantine, the, the sun god, um, was going out to battle, was going to lose, and he saw a sign in the heavens. And it looked like a cross, but it wasn't really. And he thought, well, maybe that's Jesus. And he saw the sign in heaven, and he saw letters in heaven that said, In hoc senio vences, which means, in this sign, conquer. And so Constantine said, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna call ourselves Christians. Everybody now in Rome is a Christian. 
And it, that's how it happened. That's the beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. But they use this logo, In Hoc Signo Ventus. By the way, the Masons use the same, same logo, same idea, same concept, four words. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. But anyway, that's what that represents. It's in the Bible, by the way. These 32 rays or these 32 lines coming out, the United Nations logo, the Japanese flag, uh, the Vatican, the Jesuit logo, it's actually in the Bible. And you have one in the middle. Notice, and we've talked about this before, but look at this. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. And Ben Hadid, the king of Syria, gathered together, or gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him. And horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it, and sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said unto him, Thus saith Ben Hadid, Thy silver and thy gold is mine, thy wives also, and thy children, even the goodliest, are mine. Stop right here. If there was ever a spirit that characterized the United Nations, it's First Kings chapter twenty, verses one through three. Here we have one king in the middle. And we have 32 kings with him that he has gathered together, united together. Because we're going to bring peace to the world, even if we have to kill everybody to do it. And oh, by the way, the United Nations thinks that all the money should be theirs. All the gold should be theirs. All the women, all the children, United, UNICEF. Is about the, the United Nations Rights of Children Declaration is all about the children. The United Nations basically says, these poor parents in the world, they don't know how to raise children. We're going to take over. If there was ever a spirit behind the United Nations, you see it right here in the scriptures. They're going to own everything. And even down to the number, 32 kings with the 33rd in the middle. That's that's the United Nations right there. That number 33, you see it? Here it is. Here it is. Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Okay? Represent, remember, we have the fusion. We have, we have basically the same logo. It just looks different. We have the number 33. We have a crown. And we have a fusion together. And it's about ordo ab chao, which means out of chaos. You know, you know what chaos, you know what the word chaos came from? It's the Greek word for the abyss or the pit. So literally it means out of the pit comes order. The beast rose up out of the pit. So the United Nations logo. You have 32 uh, sections which encompass the entire world centered around a 33rd point. Now, here's what really, really got me going with this. Because I looked at it, like I say, it was on a Saturday, and I went, oh, I get it. I understand now. And my understanding came, not as a result of me reading 4,000 occult books. My understanding came as a result of just reading and believing every word of God is pure. I just believe the Bible's pure, and I believe it's right, and I believe that this Bible says things that they will never say. It's going to reveal secrets. They said, what are you getting at, Pastor? I want you to look at, and just kind of look at the map here. You, have, you can see South America, you can see North America, you can see Africa and Europe and Australia and Japan and China and Russia. And I want you to notice that the 33rd part of this map, uh, the center point, the center point of the United Nations logo, what, what, what part of the earth is that? It's the north, the north pole. It's the center point. Now, why are you saying, yeah, so what? Let me, me kind of do a little explanation here for you, then we're going to get into the scriptures, all right? Uh, how is, you know how the north, north pole is determined? It's determined because there is a magnetic field in the earth. What causes the earth's magnetism called gravity? What causes that? It's the fact that at the center of the earth is a gigantic, great, big, molten ball of iron. Iron kingdom. You think about that. Okay? And in Daniel 7... Revelation 13, Revelation 17, Daniel's fourth, what do they do? They rise 
up. That's how, I mean, you have a compass, and it's based upon the fact that magnetism makes that there is a pole on the earth called the North Pole. It's called Magnetic North. And the United Nations logo is centered specifically upon this particular point. And it's done that way for a reason. There's even a star. This is, this is like only God can do this. Okay, Only God can make the universe in such beautiful harmony and fashion as it is. By the way, God is the one who created the winter solstice, summer solstice. I mean, he created all of those things. They are for signs and for, they're for four things. Signs, seasons, days, and years. And he did it on the fourth day. Okay, just saying. So anyway, but even only God can do this. The, the, the magnetic north pole of the earth points directly at one particular star in the whole universe. And it's called Polaris, which means the north star. And here's, here's like, a, this is an awesome picture of it. If you look right in the, in the middle here, there's a star just sitting there. This is a nighttime photography. And what they have to do is take the camera, point it up at the sky, and they open the shutter. That's why all the stars look like they made lines. Is because the shutter is open the whole time that the stars moved in a circle. And they all moved in a circle around one particular star. It's the North Star. Okay, so we have a magnetic north and we have the north star, Polaris. Stars are like pictures of angels in the Bible. And here's where it gets interesting. You're going to like this. We have the north star and swimming around the north star, right, right up next to it, you know, they have these constellations. And I, I always heard when I was a kid, you know, if you go out and you, the ancient man would look up in the sky... And they would say, oh, look, those stars, that looks like a Leo. That's a lion. And I used to go out there and I'd go, that does not look like a lion to me. It doesn't. It doesn't look, I don't know, I don't know where they got that. Oh, look, a woman holding a set of scales. And I would go, now the Big Dipper, I get that one. That looks like a Big Dipper. But the rest of them, I, I don't know where they got it from. The occult world or whatever. But anyway, we have the star. And we have two particular constellations that's, that are right here at the north. And they go around the north star. One of them is called Ursa Major. Okay? Or Arcturus. We'll find out about that in a minute. The other one is... Ursa Major is a bear, by the way. The other one is called Draco. He's... The dragon. Think about that. Who is the dragon? It's Lucifer. Think now, we're talking about the United Nations logo and the powers of the north, represented by the north. So here we have the dragon at the north, who is the ultimate power behind this. Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns. And upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a, look at there, a bear. And his mouth is the mouth of a lion. And notice this. And the dragon gave him his Power and his seat and great authority. Powers, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The Daniel says the Antichrist is going to be the God of forces. Earth, air, fire, and water. That's what that represents. He's going to give him his power, his seat, which means he's in charge. He sits on a throne. And great authority. He is represented by the logo of the United Nations as the one who is going to have total power over all the earth. There is even a part of the United Nations called the North Star Alliance. It's actually part of uh, the United Nations World Food Program. Remember, Ben Hadad and his 32 kings are telling everybody, all your silver and gold's mine, all your women are mine, and all your children are mine. I own everything. And what do we see the United Nations doing? The United Nations is spreading its tentacles around the world in order to gain control of the Earth's food sources. 
Because if you, listen to this, this, this is pretty slick. If you can control the food, you control the people. You see where I'm going? If you, by the way, my old boss used to have, he was, he was a wise man. He used to say, Hoggard, you know what the golden rule is? Well, we both knew what the Bible version of it was. And I said, what? He said, whoever has the gold rules. And I went, oh. See how it works? If you own the wealth, if you own the oil, if you own the food, if you own the land. In this country, we're de- see, America, we're landowners. Okay? We believe that God gives man the blessing of private property ownership. That's a blessing from God. When God sent Israel into the land, he said, you put your feet on that land, it's yours. They spent years surveying out the land of Israel and giving it to the tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim and, uh, and um, uh, Gad and Naphtali and, and Issachar and all these other tribes of Israel. <clears throat> and they owned that land and God gave them that land. And they didn't even have a king to rule over them to tell them what they could and could not do with that land. God said, it's your land. It is your land. Do what you want with it. They were smart. They would raise crops and take care of that land so they could feed their family and keep doing that for perpetual generations. The United Nations comes along into America and says, it's not really your land anymore. We have designated this. We we took a magic wand and went, and we have designated this land as a United Nations biosphere. Because we found there's a little worm on a tree on your farm that's in danger. And if you do something like plow your field, you're going to endanger the habitat of that little worm. And that little worm was crying when we went by. He was so sad. So we're going to take your land. Oh, you can keep the deed. We don't need it. We're just going to draw a map that says we have jurisdiction over this and you can't do anything that we don't tell you to do. See, then it's not your land anymore. See how it works? They had the, part of this program was the North Star Alliance. Okay? Now, uh, let's look at this logo, with the United Nations logo. Take a look at it. And I want to show you this. This is what adorns most maps in the world. This goes all the way back to the 1500s. A guy uh, started putting this on maps as a legend. It's called a compass rose. I want you to notice the same, it has the same look here. You have the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west. They They are sort of divided up again, and then they're divided up again. So in a compass rose, a real compass rose, what you will have is that you will have 32 sections that are surrounding the center point of the compass rose. Okay, now re- and remember, uh, we learned this from our talk on the Da Vinci Code. Dan Brown talks about in the Da Vinci Code that the rose is a symbol for like the female, the, uh, the mystery Babylon or whatever. The rose is a symbol for secrecy. Anything that was said sub rosa or under the rose was done in secret. You go to Roseline Chapel, the Rosalind Chapel in uh, in Scotland, and there's roses all on the ceiling, which means that there's secrets here about this building that we don't want anybody to know about. So the compass rose denotes a secret of some kind that they are keeping. And I want you to notice on this compass rose, and and you can find many, many illustrations of this same thing. This compass rose, almost always on magnetic north, is a certain symbol. It's called the fleur de lis, or the lily flower. It's a French term. The Merovingian kings used this symbol almost exclusively. It was a symbol of their domination and a symbol of their power. The Merovingian kings supposedly were the offspring of Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. Not true. The real myth about the beginnings of the Merovingian kings was that uh, a sea creature, a beast, 
had it with a human woman and created a baby. And from that baby came all of these kings who had all these divine rights. The divine right of kings, that idea comes from this idea that they're actually like half gods. Remember what the laurel represented. It was the fusion of opposites, the generative powers coming together to produce this particular king. Sons of God, daughters of men. And you can kind of see that. And I want you to look at the symbol here. You have three things pointing straight up, and they are larger than the three things pointing down, but they're banded together. It denotes sons of God, daughters of men. You actually have like, the, you have three on top and three on bottom. If you were to draw that out, you would see the number 33. So the fleur de lis is just simply another symbol of this particular number, the number 33. It is the beast and all of his nations gathered together. That's what, that's what the Jesuit powers are all about. Gathering together, there's going to be, there's going to be one world government. There's going to be one religious institution and the Vatican has vowed to be at the head of this thing. Okay, You mark it down. But going back to this fleur-de-lis, that's what it represents. This fleur-de-lis represents the, the symbol or the power of the Antichrist that is to come. Dan Brown talked about um, the Priory of Zion. Now everybody says, see, the Priory of Zion, it never, never happened. It never was real. I think that there has always been a society of men, whether they were called the Priory of Zion or other things, that have maintained a well-kept secret throughout the years. And that secret has everything to do with the rise of the Antichrist in the last days. But the symbol of the Priory of Zion was the fleur-de-lis, the exact same symbol that you see on a compass rose. And oh, look at the bottom. Look at what it says. In hoc signo vences. What does it mean? In this sign conquer. And so the compass rose puts this symbol where? On the north. This symbol, the fleur-de-lis, is related to, uh, this is in Eliphas Levi's book um, about magic. Notice, oh, well, you know, that looks like the Star of David. It's called the Seal of Solomon. Notice you have three pointing up. You have a triangle pointing up, a triangle pointed down. Notice that one is white, one is black. Um, it represents the, the, op the polar opposites fused together to create... Here it is. Here's a term you'll understand. The United Nations is all about making men equal. The two poles fusing together to make the equator or to make things equal, to make everybody into one with one king ruling over them. That's what all these symbols represent. Now, we're going to leave you hanging right here this week in this episode. We have a lot more to show you on the second part of this teaching. You'll, I promise you, you will want to see and understand a great sacrifice is going to take place in the north. What does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with Jesus Christ? You'll see. We'll pick this up on the next Watchman broadcast. It'll be part two the secret of the United Nations. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. We'll see you the next time. Bye-bye.